Have you ever wondered if God has a plan for your life that you are not currently living? See, a lot of us would probably say that we want the life that God has planned for us. But when the time comes for us to hand over the pen of our lives, we hesitate. We all do it because that's when our trust in God is really tested. What if I don't understand what he's doing? What if I don't like the direction that my life is starting to go? What if I have to give up things that I really like? We want to believe that God has a better plan for us. So what if we just decided to let him do more of the writing? What would that kind of confidence even look like? That's what we're talking about today and we're starting right now. Do you believe that God can write a better story with your life than the story you can write? It's an honest question and I want you to think about it for a second. Do you genuinely believe that God could do a better job with your life than the job you could do without him? Yes or no? If he can, do you believe that God wants to write a better story in your life than the story that's being written right now? And if so, how do you think he would do it? Like tangibly, what would it look like for God to take over in writing the story of what happens in your life right now for the rest of the time that you have? What would that look like? Maybe if I put it this way, if your life were a movie starring you, we're both saying that we believe that God could write a better transcript for that movie, right? So what would it look like for you to let him do more of the writing? I think there are a few times in our life where God forcibly takes the pen back from us and manually takes over and does things in our life. That happens very rarely. At least in my life, it's only happened, I can think of maybe one or two times. But most of the time, on a day-to-day -day basis, week in and week out, you and I both get to exercise our free will in determining who's going to write the next scene. So what would it look like and where would your life end up if you were to figure out how to let God do more of the writing? That's what I wanted us to be talking about today. We're looking at a scene in the life of Philip. He's one of the disciples of Jesus. He's from the same hometown as Peter and Andrew, the much more famous of the disciples of Jesus. He actually was a disciple of John the Baptist, who didn't become a follower of Jesus until John the Baptist had said about Jesus, behold, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Philip stopped following John and started following Jesus. And he doesn't do a lot in the biblical record. Like he's not hardly mentioned. Just a few times you hear him mentioned and where it says these are the disciples. You also find him mentioned when he brings a friend named Nathaniel to Jesus. You find Philip, who by the way has a Greek name, so it's possible that he maybe spoke some Greek and that would have explained why there were some Greeks who were visiting Jerusalem who wanted to speak to Jesus and they asked Philip to go talk to him on their behalf. His name is actually only mentioned 30 times in the Bible. And 14 of those 30 times are going to be in the story that we're looking at today. In Acts 7, uh, Paul, Saul, murders the very first person for simply being a Christian. And then he goes on a rampage. The Bible says that Saul goes from house to house, dragging followers of Jesus out and throwing them in prison. And no doubt, killing some of them like he had already killed the first one. And the response of the followers of Jesus is to scatter into the wind. <laughs> So when Acts chapter 8 comes along, we find that Philip is one of the guys who had ran from Jerusalem when this severe persecution comes on. And he's preaching. And this is the first time and the last time he's ever mentioned in a leadership position. And he's preaching in this, in this region of Samaria. And man, it's like revival breaks out. 
like old timey stuff that you've heard about with like Billy Graham type revival, like everybody in the city starts to turn from their sin and become devoted followers of Jesus. And it's, it's radical because these are half Jewish people, not all the way Gentiles, definitely not Jews. And so the disciples who are still in Jerusalem send Peter and John up to Samaria to check on Philip's work. And uh, they're, they're amazed too. Like, wow, God is really, Jesus was serious when he said that God wanted all of the nations to know what he had done. And so all of these people in Samaria start becoming followers of Jesus. And uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 14 says, And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there to check it out. Now, what happens next does not match the script I would have written for Philip's life at all. I don't think it's the way the movie should have gone. Because in my mind, Philip needs to pull these new disciples, these new followers of Jesus together into smaller communities of gatherings so that they can encourage each other in the faith, so that they can be taught what it looks like to become followers of Jesus. I'd probably want to do like some different classes and maybe even raise up some local leadership so that when I, Philip, left the region of Samaria, they would be in good hands. But that wasn't God's plan at all. And Philip was willing to allow God to write his script. So in the story of what happens next in Philip's life, we're going to learn four truths about the direction of God for your life. And the first one is this. God will give you the direction, but he rarely tells you the destination. He'll say this direction, but he won't say what's at the end of that direction. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. This is where we're going to start reading uh, in this story of the life of Philip. Verse 26, as for Philip, remember he's just come out of this huge revival. All these people in Samaria have come to faith in Jesus and he's the guy that God has used to begin this movement. Like I said, I would think he's the guy that God would want to establish the movement. But verse 26 says, as for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south down uh, toward the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. Start walking on that road. That's what he says. And that's frustrating for me because I, I wonder why God didn't say, well, just go to this village on that road. And he would have figured out that that was the road to take, but it would have been a more specific destination for Philip. Like he would have known where he was supposed to end up, but God doesn't do that. God says, just start heading towards Gaza on the road from Jerusalem. And that seems to be consistent with the way that God has directed me in my life. He doesn't say, this is the town I want you in. He says, Sean, I want you to go in this direction. And I'm wanting to know, well, where does that direction get me? And God often doesn't, actually throughout most of scripture, you rarely see where God gives them the final destination. He just sets them on a path. Abraham is the best example of this. When Abraham was in Ur of the Chaldees, way back in Genesis chapter 12, God says, if you leave and go to a land that I will show you, there I will make of you a great nation and all the world, the, uh, all the people of the world, all the nations of the world will be blessed. But he doesn't say what nation that's going to be. He just says, go, and when you get to the land, I'll let you know you're there. And that took a huge amount of faith, I'm sure, for Abraham to just leave everything and just start heading in a direction. I think it might have even taken more faith for his wife, Sarah, to do that because God hadn't spoken to her. He'd spoken to her husband. So if Sarah was anything like my wife, Sarah would have said, well, I think you need to go back to God and ask where we're going to end up before we just get on the highway and start driving west. Right? But that seems to be the way the direction of God works in our life is that he doesn't tell you the destination. He just gives you a general direction, is what he does. I was talking about this teaching with Ricardo, who's the location pastor, uh, the, the assistant pastor in Avon. And Ricardo said that this is the way it's always worked in his life also. When he was a little boy growing up in his Haitian church, people had told him that someday you should be a pastor, you should be a pastor. And he said, there's no way 
in the world, I'll ever be a pastor. I don't want that life at all. He wanted to be an architect. So he went to undergrad and then he got into the grad school that he wanted to get into. And halfway through grad school, he found himself hating the stuff he was studying. So he didn't want to waste his money. He dropped out of grad school and then asked God, God, what do you want me to do with the rest of my life? And God did not answer him. What God did was just open up an opportunity here. Didn't say where this opportunity was going, but his sister ran a, a, a for-profit counseling center and needed help. So she hired her baby brother, Ricardo, recently dropped out of grad school to help her run the company when they had three employees. 17 years later, he'd helped her grow that business to almost 49 employees. He and his wife, Diane, started attending the Avon location here at Grace, and he got involved in the parking lot. Uh, then he got asked to lead the parking lot. And then he was asked to be in a life group, and then he was asked to lead the life group, and then he was asked to become the director of life groups. And Ricardo just, not ever having a destination for where God wanted him to go, but just noticing that God just gives him the next opportunity and he just needs to start going in that direction. I approached him one day and just said, dude, how much money are we going to have to pay you to get you to quit your sister's job and just come work for Grace Church? And that started a series of just a few conversations. And now he's a full-time pastor here at Grace Church. And he told me, if God would have told me the destination, I might not have ever headed in that direction. So it's probably a good thing he doesn't for that reason. I know that in my own life, I'm a pastor's kid, and I said I was never going to be a pastor. I wanted to be a youth pastor forever, but I never wanted to be the lead pastor. And if God had told me back then that I'd be talking to you right now, it would have scared the living tar out of me, and I wouldn't have done it. Like I would have backed out of all of it. And I'm wondering if God actually showed you a picture of what he intended the next 10 years to look like, where you'll be 10 years from now. I wonder if that wouldn't scare the living tar out of you also. So maybe that's not part of his plan at all to give you the destination. Maybe it's completely appropriate that all he wants to do when it comes to discovering the direction of God for your life, is that he's just going to point you in a direction, and maybe you ought to be okay with that for now. Um, but I know the second truth, that whatever the script ends up saying, it's going to include the second truth about God's direction in our lives, and that's this, that God is going to give you the decision to risk something. So the first one is that God's going to give you a direction, not a destination. But when he gives you that direction, it's going to come at a cost. He's going to ask you to risk something. Philip is in the middle of the greatest revival since the day of Pentecost when Peter was preaching and 3,000 people committed to faith in Jesus and were baptized in one day. And then God calls him away? Like on paper, it doesn't make sense at all. Acts chapter 8, verse 27. So he started out. God told him to go to that road towards Gaza, and he did. And he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. All of this for one person? Like he leaves a region of the world where like the message was becoming viral. Like he was seeing a move of the Spirit of God among people that wouldn't claim to be fully Jewish for the first time in human history. And God calls him to leave all of that for one dude in a desert. That sounds like a that sounds like a horrible trade. 
from my perspective. So who is this eunuch? Irenaeus, one of the early Christian fathers who was a personal disciple of a man named Polycarp, who was a personal disciple of John, wrote about this Ethiopian eunuch. And he tells us that his name is Simeon Bacchus, the eunuch. That's how he refers to him, the Simeon Bacchus, the eunuch. And what does that tell us? Well, with a name like Simeon, being one of the sons of Jacob, this eunuch was probably born Jewish. So how does he become a, a eunuch, a castrated slave in the service of the kingdom of Ethiopia? Was he a slave? Was he sold into her service by his parents who had a debt? Uh, we, we, we have no idea uh, how he comes into her service. Um, but the Candake uh, is the queen of Ethiopia. And as the Candake of all the other wives of the king of Ethiopia, it is the Candake who is responsible to produce the next king. So uh, this Candake, we know from history that she was a wealthy landowner and she had money of her own. She was incredibly wealthy. So it makes sense that she would have a personal account to take care of all of her affairs. And it also makes sense that her husband, the king of Ethiopia, would want to make sure that since her job was to produce the next heir, that any men around her would not be tempted. So he, no doubt, made all of her male employees become eunuchs. That's who this guy is. And according to Leviticus, the law of the Torah, he would not have been allowed to worship in the temple because of his medical condition. Now, if he's African with a Jewish name, he wouldn't have been able to convert to Judaism because of that same condition, which is why we think he was probably Jewish. So, so far in the story, we have a disciple named Philip who is mediocre in the lineup of disciples at best. And then we have a Jewish servant of great authority in the household of a foreigner who's physically impaired and is not even allowed to go into the temple. And if I'm thinking of all the people alive on the planet, who do you include in this next scene, this next part, this epoch, epoch, epic, and this next part of the transformation of the world with the good news of Jesus. I, I wouldn't have picked that disciple, and I definitely wouldn't have picked that foreigner. I'd have picked two completely other people for sure. I'd, I'd have wanted to pick Peter or James or John. I would have wanted to pick one of the all-stars, not one of the bench warmers. This, this isn't who I would have picked. And you probably wouldn't have picked either one of these guys also. I was a youth pastor in uh, Denver, Colorado, and I recruited some of the single adults in our church to help me with our student ministry. Um, by the way, that's a plug for anybody who wants to get involved in student ministry. Uh, and, and Chris was a, an art major at uh, CU Boulder. And uh, man, just a super nice guy, and he became a volunteer counselor in our junior high youth group. He went on a mission trip next. So he that was the first thing that he did is uh, in making himself available to God, he started helping out in the youth group. Uh, then he starts, uh, he goes on a mission trip. On this mission trip to Siberia, of all places, he takes a canoe trip up a river and he ends up in Mongolia and goes to a village that hadn't had any outside visitors in over 30 years. Uh, this village was still worshiping trees and rocks. They'd never even heard of who Jesus was in it. So broke his heart that he came back and began praying that God would send somebody to Mongolia. <laughs> and then he went to camp as a counselor with the teenagers and then told me that he was going to have to quit volunteering in the youth group because he felt God was calling him to be a missionary. But he's not a preacher. So he goes to Bible college and he becomes a volunteer at a church plant in Kansas City. And then he moves to Mongolia and rolls in art school. But he goes to Mongolia not as a missionary, but as a businessman. <clears throat> and he starts coffee shops on the main road between Russia and a lake in Mongolia that 
plays the part of Lake Tahoe for the rich Russians. And there's one highway to get there. And so he starts coffee shops on this highway in Mongolian villages that have no Jesus presence at all. And then uh, he starts this coffee shop and then he starts a Bible study. And after he gets going, he reaches out to a Korean Bible college in the capital city of Mongolia. And then he sees if anybody wants to come help him start a church. And then whoever comes out, he ends up giving them this coffee shop as a means to support their family and the building that it's in for a place for his family to live. And then he hands the new church off to them and he goes to another village and he starts it all over again. Now, I know that when I first saw Chris and I asked him to volunteer in the junior high youth group, if I'd have told him someday you're going to sell everything that you have and you're going to go to the wilderness of Mongolia to start coffee shops, he'd have said, if that's what it means to be a junior high youth counselor, I am out, right? <laughs> so one, God gave him a direction, not a destination, and... And, and two, God, for him to follow this, he knew he was going to have to do something about art school. And then he knew that it was going to have to do something about his American way of life. And uh, then my son, Garrett, my oldest son, Garrett, starts working for MANA. And, and uh, he runs the internship and residency program. Uh, so it's summer interns that are in college and... Um, and then international residencies uh, for upperclassmen in, in college. And he talks my younger son, Ryan, into spending a summer in Mongolia. So this past Tuesday night, my wife and I, at 11 o'clock at night, dropped off Ryan at Terminal E at the Boston Logan Airport to fly all by himself uh, over to Mongolia. And he had to transfer in Turkey by himself. And I know he's 20. Right, he's not a kid, but they're 12 hours ahead of us. So whatever time it is right now, they are exactly 12 hours ahead of us. And I know that if something happened to my son, that the book of flight and actually get there would take 48 hours at the very least. And so when you begin following Jesus, he's gonna ask you to take risks. So the risk that God asked my son to take this summer was to spend the summer away from home. And the risk that he called my wife to take is to let go of her son uh, for two months on the other side of the world. And that's what it looks like uh, to follow Jesus. I wish God would tell me where all of this is going with my son, but I know that he's not going to. What I do know is that from where you are right now, God can get you where you need to be right now. But if you're waiting for him to tell you how the story ends, you're going to miss it. And if you think it will come without risk, then you're going to miss it. The truth is, every one of us who's a follower of Jesus, we're all in this together. And every one of us are struggling with whether or not we should do the risky thing that God's put on our heart. And your yes to the risky thing that God puts on your heart and the direction that he hasn't told you where it's going to end up is the path for you discovering the direction of God in your life. The eunuch doesn't slow down for Philip when he shows up, by the way. And the eunuch doesn't even initiate a conversation with him, leading me to the third truth about the direction of God in your life. And that's this. God is going to give you another decision to risk something else. <laughs> I wish it was one risk and then it's over, but that's, that's not the way it goes in the story of Philip. It's not the way it goes in the story of Ricardo and the story of Chris Ballinger or anybody else. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, all right, now that you're here, go over and walk alongside along beside the carriage. So Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. So Philip asked him, Philip is initiating and respond, like the Holy Spirit said, go on the road. So he goes on the road. Then here comes a chariot and the Holy Spirit says, now I want you to do something else. Now go do this. He's like, are you ever going to make it easy for me? And I don't think the answer is ever yes. And we'll get to why in just a minute. 
But Philip asked the man, do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, the man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The, me- the passage of scripture that he had been reading was this. It's from the book of Isaiah. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus, who this passage of scripture was talking about. And as they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? Verse 38. So he ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized this random dude on his way to Ethiopia. I think somehow we think, after taking some huge step of faith, that we're done. I did the thing. Now, dear Lord, you do your thing. Fix this. But that's not how it works. In the scriptures and in my own life, one risk always leads to another risk. They build on each other, like a weightlifter. You don't start bench pressing 300 pounds, you start benching much less than that and keep adding weight. But you don't start at 100 pounds and leave it there. So God, when you take your first risk, he doesn't leave you with just the tens on the either side. He's going to put the tens and now he's going to put the fives on there. And then he's going to take off the fives and put on another 10. And then he's going to put the 25 pound plates on there. And right, like one risk always leads to the next. Like with Katie. Katie is on staff here at Grace Church, but she grew up in our student ministry. She started attending, I think she said in seventh grade. God gets a hold of this girl's heart along the way through our student ministry again, and she goes to Liberty University down in Lynchburg, Virginia, and she got a degree in strategic communications. And then coming out of college, she had the opportunity, and she could have taken several other jobs, but after prayer, and for the sake of ministry itself, she came back here to Grace Church and got a job here running all of our social media communications and she volunteers in the student ministry as well. But that wasn't the only risk that she was asked to take because recently she was asked to leave this job by God, she thinks. And God never spoke to her, it's just another opportunity. And she's moving to Sweden in October and she'll be there for two years working for Campus Crusade, who's a nonprofit organization that doesn't sell or make anything to sell. It's a ministry to reach college students in Sweden, and they're not paying her. And she has to raise 100% of her salary. (laughs) You know, that's got to be scary. (laughs) Moving over there for two years without any source of income other than the willingness of those who are following Jesus stateside to get behind that girl. Like that's, now if we'd have told her that when she was a ninth grader, That when you're an adult, you're going to move to Europe. By the way, northern, freezing cold Europe. You're not going to get paid a dime, and you're going to have to stay there for two years serving Jesus, learning a new language so that you can speak to people who don't understand a thing you're saying. (laughs) I think think she would have balked, right? But what God does is he gave her direction, and she took her first risk. And what did God do? He took off the two tens, and he put on the 25s. That's what he did, and that's what he does. Uh, And what do you think is going to happen at the end of her two years? I have no idea, but I can guarantee you it's going to require some other type of risk. John Piper says, God is doing 10,000 things in your life right now, and you may only be aware of three of them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we're playing chess, but God is playing checkers. So the question is, are you willing to move the piece to that square or not? Well, I I don't want to know. I want to know where all the other pieces are. He's not going to tell you where all the other pieces are. You get to decide whether or not you want to be a part of the game. 
The question is, do you trust that he knows how to play it? It's a question I started off with at the beginning. Do you believe that God can write a better story with your life than you can? If you're waiting on God to give you the end, you're going to miss it. If you think it's going to come without a price, you're going to miss it. And if you think all you're going to do is make one hard choice, you're going to miss it. God wants to add weight. Like he's the professional bodybuilding coach who knows in you he's got a champion. Everybody else sees a neutered servant in the court of the candake when they see you. Everybody else sees an average middling disciple. But what God knows is that in you and through you, he's got a much bigger, much bigger game happening. Those of us who are called by God to follow Jesus are called to a life of constant risk. If it wasn't risky, we wouldn't need faith. In Hebrews eleven six 6 says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to God must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Do you believe that he rewards those who sincerely seek him? If so, then are you right now sincerely seeking him? Back to the weightlifter. Every time you add weight, it stretches you so much that your muscles begin to tear. They rebuild, and then you add weight again. And at some point, you're going to find yourself benching more than your body weight. You're going to find yourself doing things you never thought you would end up doing like building coffee shops in the middle of the wilderness between Russia and their Lake Tahoe, or walking away from your sister's business that you helped build to go help people become better followers of Jesus. If you sincerely seek God, asking him to show you what now, then here's the fourth truth. God will take you farther than you ever could on your own. Acts chapter 8, verse 39 says, When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north, the town of Azotus, and he preached the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. That snatching away thing only happened to three other people in all of human history. It happened first to a man named Enoch in the book of Genesis. It happened second to a man named Elijah. And then, of course, it happened to Jesus. None of the other disciples experienced that. Philip did, though. Philip, the man who was a follower of John the Baptist, is the only the fourth person and not the final. That'll, all, that'll happen to everybody, at some, all, all followers of Jesus, at some point again. But at this time, this present moment in history, Philip's only the fourth person to have ever experienced that. According to the early church father Eusebius, Simeon Bacchus, the eunuch of Queen of Ethiopia, went back home to Africa and started one of the earliest Christian movements in history. The African expression of Christianity predates colonialism by over a thousand years, by the way. The African expression of Christianity has remained faithful to the gospel of Jesus to this day. And even now in Ethiopia, 63% of the population claim faith in Jesus. Ethiopia is one of the earliest countries in all of human history to name Christianity as its official religion. The Aksumite kingdom is one of the most influential ancient civilizations, and they converted en masse to becoming followers of Jesus in their early 300s, which is almost the exact same time that Europe did when Constantine converted to Christianity. Western Africa converted to Christianity en masse at the same time that Europe did. And from Ethiopia, the gospel spread through the rest of Eastern Africa 
and Western Arabia. All because Philip was willing to let go of something that he may have thought was bigger, to go talk to one man in the middle of the desert. Everything amazing in your life has come from some small step of faith and some act of courage, right? What would happen if you were to approach your faith with that same kind of intensity, commitment, and resolve? What if you were as serious about your spiritual fitness as you were your physical fitness? What if you risked as much financially for the kingdom of God as you did when you started your company? What if you were meant for more than just yourself? We're starting a new summer season right now. And over the next three months, what I want you to do this summer is I want you to pray bolder, bigger prayers. What if you took bolder steps of faith in your obedience to God for the next three months? What if you were more serious about memorizing scripture and sharing your faith in small and big ways over the next three months? What if you gave more to the cause of Christ in the next three months than in any other three-month period in your life? What if you said, I will not be more committed to my career than to my church family? What if you decided not to eat breakfast until you've read the Bible? What if you committed to be radically honest with your time at work? What if you were determined to pray right there on the spot anytime anyone asks you to pray for anything from now on? The Smithsonian Magazine wrote an article on Christianity in the Aksumite Kingdom in ancient Ethiopia. Archaeologists found one of the oldest church buildings and inscribed on the eastern wall of this church in Ethiopia from the Aksumite Kingdom is this phrase. Because Christ is favorable to us. That's why you would do this. Because Jesus is more favorable to you. When it comes to my time, my calendar, my wallet, my budget, my family, my relationships, my physical health, my mental health, my wealth and all my possessions, my hopes and my dreams. Dear God in heaven, let me be able to say, because Christ is more favorable to me. This is how you get the life that God dreamed up for you by saying in every moment of every day because Christ is more important to me. That's why I will read no Bible, no breakfast, right? That's why I will honor God with my resources. That's why I will be honest at work. That's why I will have integrity in my business dealings. This is why I will be an open-handed, generous person towards the needs of those around me. This is why I will forgive easily and I will love freely and I will serve sacrificially because Christ is favorable to me. This is how you discover the script that God's been wanting to write in the movie of your life. This is how you become the person that God created you to be. I can't do this for you, but dang it, you can. You just have to choose in the next scene of your movie to do whatever crazy fool thing God puts in your heart to do. No risk is too big. No act of selflessness is too much and no distance is too far. Dear God in heaven, May each of us say, I will do anything God asks me to do, starting now. Let's pray. God, I love you with all of my heart. And I'm thankful that you took two average people, at best, average. And you changed all of Eastern Africa and Western Arabia and there are still churches that are descendants, that are 2,000-year-old descendants of the first churches that were started as a result of Simeon Bacchus and the rest of the Ethiopians who became followers of Jesus. God, you know all of their individual stories. I bet there's some awesome ones in there. I, I can't, honestly, I, I just can't wait to meet Simeon Bacchus and Philip. Thank you for the way that they 
are right now inspiring me. And I pray that your Holy Spirit is using their story to inspire each of us to greater acts of devotion to you, selflessness towards others, and greater steps of obedience that will end up taking us into the life that we've always dreamed of, but we're working on our own to find. God, help us to trust you enough to obey you with everything we do. In Jesus' name we ask this, amen. So what is that next step that God is wanting you to take? Maybe you know exactly what it is, but you've been too afraid to take it. Or maybe you've got no idea. Maybe you're new to faith and the whole concept of taking risks in this life that you have worked very, very hard to make puts you a little bit on edge. But you have a next step too. No matter where you are, if you'd like to connect and talk through what your next step might be, I'm here for you. Or maybe you know and you're just scared and you just would like to know that somebody else is praying for God to give you boldness and courage to do what he's put on your heart. Just reach out to me using the info that you see on your screen and I'd be happy to pray with you, talk with you, and see how we can support you in this next phase of your spiritual journey. Hope that was helpful for you today and I will see you again next week.